Humans and chimpanzees are very closely related species. We share a pretty recent common ancestor. How did we become separate species? Well, that is the question we'll explore today in our lesson on speciation. Let's start by defining what a species is and what speciation means. So remember that a species is a group of organisms that can reproduce with each other, but can't reproduce with another group. In other words, they're reproductively isolated. So humans can reproduce with each other, but they can't successfully reproduce with chimpanzees. Speciation is the process where one species, like this ancestral species, splits into two or more separate species. And if you look on a phylogenetic tree, these nodes or points will tell you speciation events occurred. So to understand a process like speciation, we're going to have to apply the forces of microevolution that we learned about earlier. Essentially, all of those microevolutionary forces can add up to macroevolution like speciation. So mechanisms like genetic drift and gene flow and natural selection and mutation that cause small scale changes in allele frequencies, microevolution, if those accumulate for long enough time in a population, it can lead to macroevolution, a big change like the development of a whole new species. So evolution can be small scale and lead to large scale. In order for this to occur, reproductive isolation must happen. Those small scale changes have to add up to reproductive isolation, which occurs when genes can't flow between two different species because the species can't mate with each other. And there's a couple ways that this can happen. Two general categories, but many, many barriers can prevent species from reproducing with each other. If the barriers prevent the gametes from getting together, then we call those pre-zygotic barriers because the zygote never forms. Some barriers, though, occur after the zygote forms, and those are called post-zygotic barriers. So the egg and the sperm will fuse, but the zygote doesn't develop properly into viable, fertile offspring. Viable means they survive, and fertile means they can reproduce. So let's quickly take a look at some examples of pre- and post-zygotic barriers. Habitat isolation is a pre-zygotic barrier where two very similar species might not reproduce because they live in different areas. Like this snake lives on land, but this snake species lives on, in the sea. Temporal isolation has to do with time. Think temporary time. These two skunk species are very similar, but they reproduce at different times of the year, so that prevents their zygotes from ever forming. Mechanical isolation is when the genitalia, the reproductive organs of two species, just aren't compatible with each other. So in the case of these two snail species, because their spirals move in the opposite direction, their genital organs don't line up properly, and so, again, the egg and the sperm cannot meet. Finally, gametic isolation occurs in the case of these sea urchins. The red and the purple are two different species, and the reason is because the sperm from one of the sea urchin species is unable to penetrate the egg of the other species. In order for fertilization to occur, the sperm has to first of all be able to sense the egg through chemical signals, and then it's got to bind to the egg, to proteins on the eggs, and then it has to be able to penetrate the outer layer so that its chromosomes can get inside the egg. In the case of gametic isolation, that just doesn't happen. Behavioral isolation is also prezygotic. These are two different lizard species because their courtship rituals are different. The way this one bobs its head to attract mates is different than the way this species bobs its head to attract mates. You can also see a difference in the color of their dewlap, and females of this species find this particular one kind of sexy, and females of this species find this type of dewlap sexy. Now, quickly, two different post-zygotic mating barriers. So in the case of these salamanders, 
they are able to reproduce with each other and produce offspring, but the offspring don't live very long. They generally die before they can reproduce. So the offspring aren't fit and ultimately are selected against. In the case of a horse and a donkey, they can also reproduce, make a zygote, which does develop into a nice healthy mule, but the mule itself is sterile. And so, because it can't produce offspring, it also has low fitness and reproductive isolation has occurred. So, how can these reproductive barriers arise? Well, there's two main mechanisms for speciation. The first mechanism is the most common, allopatric. Allo means other and patric refers to fatherland. So, this speciation starts off with a physical barrier like maybe a stream or ravine or chasm, and then that leads to reproductive isolation. Note that the physical separation isn't sufficient. We have to follow that up with reproductive isolation. So let's see how that might happen. For example, in the case of these two squirrel species separated by this huge barrier. So imagine this is the original squirrel species, the ancestral species. All right. A change in the environment splits that population into two different populations. And because of that barrier, genes can't flow between the two populations. So over time, mutations accumulate in one population that are different from the mutations in the other population. Meanwhile, other forces of evolution, like natural selection or genetic drift, will also act on these mutations and change the populations in different ways. And those changes build up and build up and build up until the two populations are just so different that they are now reproductively isolated. And in some cases, the species may overlap and meet again and even hybridize. But if those hybrids from the two species are less fit, we still have reproductive isolation being reinforced. Now there's one other main method of speciation called sympatric speciation. It's much less common because it doesn't involve a geographical barrier. Two species arise and become reproductively isolated without anything actually preventing their interaction. Um, so how might this happen, you ask? Well, one way is through disruptive selection. If you have two very different types of environment and two extreme phenotypes, those two phenotypes might diverge to the point where they become separate species. Similarly, sexual selection could lead to sympatric speciation. If you have certain organisms preferring certain phenotypes, if that accumulates in the population, you could eventually have two different species. The final method for sympatric speciation is called polyploidy. And what happens here is, due to a problem with meiosis, the chromosomes of an organism are duplicated. So during meiosis, we should have halved these chromosomes, but instead, something happened and then, when these gametes get together, we end up with a zygote that has more chromosomes than it should. It should be 2n equals 6, but really now it has 4n equals 12. And bam, now this is a whole new species. Now, with many organisms like animals, this would never work. The zygote would die, it would be inviable. But with plants, they can manage this way, and then they can self-fertilize. So polyploidy is very common in plants. In fact, the majority of plant species have arisen due to polyploidy, these mistakes in meiosis. So our last note about speciation. How quickly does this happen? Well, in, for most organisms, it takes many, many years. But the rate can be inconsistent. Sometimes it can happen via something called punctuated equilibrium in which there's a sudden speciation event, perhaps due to a dramatic environmental change, and then that's followed by periods of very little change. Or we can have gradualism, which is where one ancestral species gradually changes over time into two separate species. 
It's hard to find evidence of this in the fossil record. When we do find evidence, it's in the form of transitional fossils, fossils that have characteristics in between that of the ancestor and the new species. Punctuated equilibrium is easier to find evidence of, the of in the fossil record. We find the ancestral species and the new species, but often nothing in between. So that concludes our exploration of how two species can arise from one ancestral species.